right there. Okay. Yay. Hi, everyone. Okay, let me get my audio on. Did you tell you're joining the show? Okay, yeah. sounds the show, yeah. good. It's the show. Okay, so hi, everyone. Um, welcome back to episode two of uh, the Tequitos program. I am joined by my studio audience um, who decided to wake up, I think, a little bit earlier from her nap. Uh, so the Hadlets are here in full effect. Kind of excited um, for our episode two. Last week was our first um, go at, at the Taquitos program, and we looked at um, kind of like this new take on Chinampas. So just to kind of review, what the heck is a Taquitos program? Um, Taquitos is a program that is designed to encourage families to uh, explore STEM, but with a very specific focus, and that is um, my hope is that we can, um, we can kind of revisit some older forms of technology and explore the people and the culture behind those ideas um, at the time of that form of technology, look at how it exists in present day, and also kind of just use our creativity and imagine what the future might look like. Um, you know, as always, I'm, I'm inspired by um, the, those who have been forgotten, who have left their imprint in technology and innovation, um, and also inspired by my own cultural roots. Um, so I am looking for interesting stories of Latin America, of, again, of these older forms of tech that um, have been kind of lost or maybe rebranded. Um, so... Without further ado, uh, let's get started, shall we? Okay, so this week's topic, let me just jump over here. So this week's topic is uh, space age sounds. Um, uh, I think it's pretty fitting considering today um, Elon Musk's uh, uh, company SpaceX is launching their uh, spacecraft into outer space. Uh, along with the aircraft are two astronauts from NASA. Uh, and what makes this really an interesting time is this is the first time that a private company is pretty much, you know, um, running the show. Typically, these kinds of launches happen um, on the uh, at by NASA, and NASA is really the control mission or mission control center, and this time it's a little different. So um, I think that this is definitely going to be an exciting time and also a time for us to kind of question about how people are able to explore space and the resources that are at uh, certain people's fingertips to make that happen. Uh, it's def definitely very different than um, what space exploration looked like decades ago. So in that realm, I'm going to go down here. Okay. So yeah, we are going to be talking about space age sounds. Um, and as I mentioned, it's pretty fitting given that um, today... Uh, a spacecraft is being launched into outer space. Um, but I'm going to take it back to a individual, um, a native of Tampico, Mexico. Um, this guy's name is Juan Garcia Esquivel. And he has been dubbed the father of space age pop. Uh, and so just, I guess, let's, let's stop there for a moment. Let's talk a little bit about who this guy is. Um, my, from what I have, from what my research has shown, um, seems to be a pretty curious, uh, he was a pretty curious little boy, loved music and loved taking things apart, things that produced music, right? And he would take things apart, uh, like a player piano, and try to figure out how those notes were tuned, how they all worked. And so from a very early age, uh, became very passionate about composing music, writing music, performing music. Um, he went on to do all sorts of amazing things, uh, not just as a composer, a band leader, and a musician. Um, he actually kind of uh, created this sub-genre of music. And I think... 
Um, in order to really understand that subgenre of music, you have to know what was happening around the 50s and 60s, which is when he really um, spreads his wings and, and um, becomes a lot more famous. So um, he, what, <laughs> what was happening around that time was, um, well, of course, a lot of folks were interested in space exploration. So that is probably one of the most interesting um, aspects that influences is the, the genre of space age sounds um, and or space age pop, excuse me. But there was also this, this optimism, this, the ideas of like, wow, this is what the future might look like. And at the time, people had big ideas of how our furniture would be robotic, how it could move around, uh, how everything would look so sleek and modern and just far out. And, um, and, and actually, I think, uh, you know, um, mid-century furniture, that's still pretty popular even now. Like, heck, I, when I go, uh, when, uh, when I am looking for like a chair or a couch, I kind of tend to gravitate to these really sleek um, silhouettes of couches. And that's all products of mid-century furniture. Um, I even think about the clothes, like, mod clothes, like they, there was lots of big shapes, geometric shapes and patterns that um, are very popular around this time. Um, so you have this kind of space agey music, this kind of, um, I don't know, the, the, like clothes that have geometric prints and even furniture also looking kind of space agey. Um, music wise, you have, um, I'm trying to think of some more of the popular um, uh, what do you call it, like uh, musicians at the time. Um, the Rat Pack comes to mind. And so it's folks like Frank Sinatra, um, Sammy Davis Jr., um, Dean Martin. So it's a very, like, you can start to see this um, trend in a very cool, like, suave sense um, in, in the field of music. Um, so here's what happens with Esquivel. He embraces a lot of those influences, but to kind of keep true to his roots, he fuses in um, jazz, Latin jazz. He fuses in some calypso, some samba, a little bit of bossa nova. And so you truly end up with this interesting product of Latin American culture um, influences with this space age sound. Um, and in the end, what happens is you, um, you get this uh, very, like, sleek, kind of loungy, easy listening music. Um, I believe, you know, the, the space age pop is also referred to as bachelor pad music, which I'm not so crazy about. But anyway, the, the point is that he, he kind of... Um, he puts his imprint on this particular subgenre of music. Um, and it's actually still referenced. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the, a uh, couple weeks ago, um, we were watching Nacho Libre at home. And I, I said, I said to my husband, I said, I think I recognize this um, composition. And sure enough, it was one of Juan uh, Garcia's Esquivel's um, songs. Um, Mucha Muchacha, and, um, and his music has also made it into, like, the Big Lebowski, um, I'm trying to, I can quickly, I think I have a list of some other interesting um, Hollywood films, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. no, but I, I don't think I have it after all, but Nonetheless, um, I mean, he was big enough. He did a lot. He, he opened quite a bit for Frank Sinatra, um, which also says quite a bit. Uh, in any case, this is not exactly a household name. You probably would be familiar with uh, Frank Sinatra, but not necessarily Juan Garcia Esquivel. And, um, and hopefully now you will remember that. So anyway, um, let's take a quick peek. Unfortunately, I can't sample his music just because I don't, I think that's a big no-no, <laughs> but, um, but I am going to kind of merge some of the ideas behind his music with what 
actually happens in space with like those spooky outer space sounds. And we're going to create our own um, space age sounds uh, with some household objects. So this is a fun activity you can do with your family. Um, and listen, what's great about this is all you have to do is be creative in finding different uh, objects that will pick up vibration. And that's really what we're trying to capture. That's going to be, that's going to create those um, kind of interesting outer space sounds later. So I'm going to be tapping into our inner Esquivel uh, talents a little bit later. Um, let's jump. So couple of things about, so today we're going to be working with household instruments. I do want to show you some interesting instruments that came up around that time um, um, that Esquivel is um, becoming prominent in the music industry. And let me just, uh, there we go. Okay, let me just show you what I've got there. So here we have Oh, the first picture on the, on the top left is just, um, again, you're, you're seeing a lot of art inspired by space exploration, and, and that's just a little um, piece of art that I wanted to throw in there. But below is um, Robert Moog. Um, Robert Moog actually is, uh, he's, he was an engineer, pioneer, um, and... I think kind of accidentally became um, like the father of the synthesizer or electronic music. I mean, when you sit, when you hear electronic music, that probably means something to you now, but I think back then, totally different, right? Um, so yeah, he was the inventor of the very first commercial synthesizer, um, and that was uh, released in 1964. So that's him on the bottom there, and that's a picture of him in front of the synthesizer. And if you've ever seen a synthesizer, it's got all sorts of like interesting um, like knobs. I mean, it's, it's a mixer board. It's all sorts of things to distort sound. And, um, and what's cool about that is that it really, you have such a wide range of sound production. Um, I've played around with uh, synthesizers before, and I am, I'm always so, uh, it's like being a kid, just making these really cool um, sounds that you haven't, that you might not be familiar with. Um, really quick story. Uh, last year, um, there was a, like a Moog Fest, no, it wasn't a Moog Festival, it was called Plantasia. It was at the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. And it was um, basically this kind of Moog synthesizer music that was, um, that was coupled with different plants around the botanical gardens. And the idea there was that, if, you know, depending on how you played the synthesizer, it would create or, or elicit a response from the plants. Um, you probably have heard if you talk lovingly to a plant, they may respond or they may grow better. Well, so it was the same idea, but with synthesizer music. And it was super cool to play around with all these different synthesizers. Okay, the next uh, and the final instrument is a little bit older. This is the Thurman. Um, the woman that's uh, in the center of the, of the screen there is, let me just quickly, I, don't, I hope I'm not saying her name wrong, Alexandra, oh boy, I forgot her last name. My apologies, I'll have to pull that up in a little bit. But nonetheless, the instrument that she is um, on is an electronic um, musical instrument that's controlled without actually touching it. Uh, its inventor was Leon Thurman, and he patented that instrument in 1924. Um, so the way it works is you have these two metal antennas. In this picture, you have one that stand, that's standing upright, and the other one is on the, the side of the Thurman. Um, and so basically it creates this sound by moving your hands, um, depending on that position of where you move your hands, it can create the frequency and the, and control the volume or the amp, uh, amplitude. Um, and so those electrical signals from the Thurman are then amplified and sent through the speaker, um, which is that other thing that's standing up like that stand there. Um, 
and it makes some really interesting and really like eerie, echoey music or sounds. Um, I remember <laughs> the first time I have I saw a Thurman was at a uh, a comedy show in um, here in. Gowanus, Brooklyn. Eugene Merman uh, did a really funny bit um, using a Thurman. Uh, so he did some comedy and then played it with a Thurman. I thought it was hilarious. But that was the first time I had ever seen a Thurman. And uh, I was really intrigued with how it even worked. And so it's great that, you know, after doing some research, I found out like how that kind of makes it into the scene. The, the Thurman and the synthesizer also kind of make their way into the scene around the, um, the music scene in the 50s and the 60s. And so some of that crosses over into the space age um, genre. Um, so let me move on to the next slide. So yeah, I thought it'd be interesting to look at those in instruments. Um, however, we do not have a Thurman and I do not have a synthesizer, but we can be creative. Uh oh okay thank you oh wow looks like <laughs> okay guys so let me see if I can quickly I'm gonna pull up this uh okay guys so I showed you some of the more formal instruments that make their way into this subgenre of space age music and space age sounds. I want to compare it to, um, or at least show you a little bit of what space actually sounds like, like um, uh, because it's, it's definitely a very spooky. Um, and I think some of it can actually be um, captured if you play around with a Thurman or the synthesizer, or as you're going to see in a few minutes with some household products. So the first one I want to just sample for you is of the sun. Now this is uh, this is what NASA captured. This here is sun sonification, and I'm just going to see. Looks like it's playing, but I don't see any sound. It's playing through your, it's playing through that, can't hear it. They can hear it though? Hear okay. Okay. Good. We have a quick clarification. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. I can hear it. Okay, so it's just a nice humming sound. If you're standing by your uh, AC, you may hear s a similar sound. Um, let's keep going down the list. Okay. This one's cool because it's got some echo and sound or wind. Okay, here is Voyager plasma sounds. Don't ask me what that's about. I don't know. <laughs> ah. So this was just static. Ooh, with a high whistle. Cool. All right, I'm gonna jump to this one because this sounds like um, if you if you've ever uh, gone to a um, like <laughs> if you've ever been pregnant and you've gone to your checkups, they will listen to the baby's heartbeat, and this is what th this sounds like. Thank <laughs> you. 
Maybe that's the wrong one. Okay. There we go. That's the sound of a baby in a womb. Okay, I think we'll stop sampling some of those spooky sounds um, because now it's time to actually try to create those uh, sounds with some objects. Okay, you guys ready to create your own spooky space age sounds? Hila, do you want to check this out? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have with me a box of random objects that I've collected from my apartment. Now some of these things, like I said, some of these things you might not have at home and that's okay. Um, I think it would be really cool to test out, just find objects that you think might create a good vibration and and use that, experiment with that. I think that that's really the best way to do this because otherwise you're going to look up YouTube uh, like a list of materials and and most likely it's not going to be things that you have around the house. So let's start off, let's start off with something that's, um, that you m most likely will have. And that is, um, oh, let me, I'm going to quickly, oh, okay. I'm going to quickly show you the list before I start making these sounds. Okay. So, Here's the list of things that I'm using, and again, I'll show you as we go along. But the first one that we're going to explore is uh, a balloon and a hex nut, okay? So, Elo, what sound do you think this might make when I put this in here and jiggle it? Think of any kind of sound. Okay, all right. Well, let's check this out. So, what you're going to do is we're going to just drop that in. The hex nut goes right into the balloon. Oh, my nose is itchy. And then we blow. Oh, I did that. Okay. Now I'm just, I'm not even going to tie it, guys. Lazy for that. I'm just going to wiggle it around. Ready? All right, let's try this again. I'm sure there's a trick. Did you hear that? It's, um, the, wait, can I try? Well, it's tied around my finger. Hold on, Bob. So, what does that sound like? Doesn't that sound it's like? It's like a violin. Oh, oh a violin? <laughs> So what we're doing is we're listening to that vibration. So what that is is um, when, you, um, when you quickly twirl it around or swirl it around, it's creating centripetal force, and that little hex nut, nut is just going super fast. That vibration against the, um, the balloon creates that high-pitch sound. You really have to know how to twist it. Uh, okay, guys, I think you got the hang of that. Um, to me, this sounds like a spaceship just whizzing by. So it's like, okay, so that's my first one. Um, Ela, could you do me a favor and pass me the bottle of water here in the can? Okay, so next. Now, oh, this one and the, um, the other one. This one I'm going to have to quickly drink. <laughs> okay. I have a cup of water here, and I have a regular aluminum can. So um, let me just quickly drink this, and then I'll tell you what we're doing. OK, guys, I apologize. OK, so with an aluminum can, it's the same idea as if you were at the beach, and you have the, um, let me make sure I'm good, um, and you have uh, like a seashell on your ear, you can, um, or up to your ear, you can kind of hear the roar of the ocean. And the same, 
thing is happening in your metal can. So you're just going to want to wipe it. Sorry, excuse me. And then just put it up to your ear. And it should sound similar to one of those um, spooky sounds from NASA that I played for you earlier, where it just sounds like, kind of like this vastness, right? Open, spooky air. Okay, super easy. You just have to use your imagination with that. One. Okay, the next one. Unfortunately, this one you may not hear. Well, not that you may not, you will not hear, but I can at least show you how this one works. This is a pretty simple one. This is just a metal hanger, and you're going to have two straws, um, or straws, sorry, strings tied to each end. And what you're going to do is just put them up to your ears. I know this looks silly, but it, it sounds pretty cool. You're going to just um, gently tap, go walk around and tap anything um, around you, and, um, and you will hear the vibration move through the strings, through the metal hanger, and right back to your ears. So like you have these, you know, it's like a direct connection there. And you should hear some really cool sounds. So just imagine here, I'm going to demonstrate how you would be doing it. You'd be walking around and... You should hear that vibration keep going for a while. It's interesting. Um, vibration. Okay, so I'm going to put that one away here. We've already done our hanger. We've done our empty can. Alrighty. We've done our balloon hex nut. Okay. One last thing I'm going to show you that I have, uh, that I had around the apartment. You might not have one and that's okay. You don't even have to use this. This is just something that I had in the apartment. Um, to kind of give that, uh, create that spacey, like wind sound, I used a stethoscope. So I just put that on ever so gently. And on the other end, you're gonna blow and tilt it forward and backwards. And you should hear almost like the static and wind um, sound at the same time. It sounds exactly like what I played for you in that playlist. So anyway, that's a really cool one too. Um, the next thing we're gonna play around with is, actually I have two more. I have this turkey baster. <laughs> you might not have one of these. You may have um, something squeezable like a, an empty, um, I'm trying to think, uh, a dish, um, dish soap bottle uh, or shampoo bottle something like that. Anything that can, can be um, turned upside down and contain water. C because the trick to this is as we squeeze the water up and blow on the small opening, you should be hearing, you'll, you'll pick up a pitch. And, um, and the way that water goes up and down will affect the sound. So let's load this up. I'm doing this, by the way, in a plastic bin because I have a feeling I'm going to make a big mess. OK, so I'm going to flip it. Whoa. Oh, <laughs> you see? <laughs> all right. So that doesn't seem all that impressive, I know. Yes, Elo? Oh, good. Elo's testing out the hanger one. So turkey baster works okay. This next one is a squeezable condiment bottle um, or um, also I've seen these used for frosting, like if you're frosting a cupcake or whatever, it's a portable one. Um, again, you don't have to use the accordion. It could be like a regular, like a ketchup squeezable bottle. Um, okay, so here I go with this one. And this one squirts quite a bit, so I'm going to try to be careful here.
So does it sound like, it should sound like a trans, trans, um, no, um, radio transistor. Uh, you should be hearing the woo, woo, along with the whistles, the high-pitched whistles that we heard um, on, I think it was the Jupiter um, uh, um, sound bite. So in any case, that small opening and the water fluctuating up and down will help create that really interesting, like, radio static slash, um, uh, what do you call it, radio um, transistor sound. Um, I'm going to try that one more time because I don't think I did a good job, but here we go. Let me see if I can get you a better spooky space age sound. Maybe you should close your eyes for this last one, yeah. Close your eyes and pretend we're in outer space. We're, we've got two tickets to the space age, uh, X uh, um, rocket, and we're off to explore. All right, guys, that last one got a little wet, but in any case, I hope you heard that high pitch and low pitch combination. So that concludes our spooky space age sounds. Um, I do want to quickly, um, I want to show you this great book that I read with my son um, last week. This is Esquivel, Space Age Sound Artist. It's both in English and Spanish. It's really fun, gives the background story to Juan Garcia Esquivel. And um, yeah, and I hope that it inspires you to go around the house and create some really cool Space Age music um, and mix it up with your favorite jam too, right? That's kind of what uh, Esquivel did. So. Um, Anyway, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I do not know what we're going to be doing next week, but I will uh, make sure it's creative, fun, and quirky. Um, anyway, thank you so much for tuning in, everyone. Uh, take care, be well, and be safe. See you next week. <laughs>